In this episode, University of Lethbridge President and Vice Chancellor Dr. Digvir Jayas explores recent trends in the food industry. As with any other industry, the food industry has been evolving over time. Changes are driven by many factors, including consumer behavior, government regulations, climate, technology, research, and the industry itself. In addition to recent trends in the food industry, Dr. Jayas talks about the factors driving these changes, using food quality monitoring as an example. This presentation highlights what role research has played and is continuing to play toward this area. Uh, today's talk, uh, I rather than making it technical, I uh, decided to uh, give you an uh, overview of the food industry and where things are going. And uh, hopefully uh, you would find uh, some information in here which would be useful to you. Uh, I would use a little bit of my research on the machine vision to show you how some of our research is being used in the, in the, in the, in the, in the industry. So first one, I want to show you what are the factors that drive the, uh, drive the trends in the food industry. And I have grouped that in the four, uh, sorry, five different uh, driving factors. Uh, naturally, where my expertise comes is from the research side. So there is a, a lot of research being done to support the agri-food industry. And some of the research is still, I would say, at the stage where it is still not influenced the uh, uh, food industry, but potential is there. Uh, recently, I had an opportunity to visit a, a lab in the United States where they were making uh, uh, salmon uh, fillets in petri dishes. Uh, so, and you could not tell the difference uh, uh, that it was not it was not a fish grown in the uh, in the aquarium or or sorry aquaponics or in the in the ocean. Uh, so that trend has not reached the market yet, but it is coming. Uh, the, uh, another trend which is the research is driving is certainly uh, manufactured food, and that really tries to is the, I'm sure you have seen uh, some of the trends which are coming also from the consumers, is that the people start consuming more plant-based protein. And with the plant-based protein, the amount of investment which the food industry has done in producing that plant-based meat products now, or the simulated meats, I shouldn't say meat products, they are not meat, but simulated meat products. And if you, nowadays you buy, you can buy hamburgers, you can buy even the simulated, you can buy beef product, for example, and you, like, uh, some people, especially who are vegetarian, even think that it looks like look too much like meat, so they don't want to eat that, but it's really not, not a meat. So they have done so much work in producing that manufactured food, and a lot of that came from the research done in the university labs and the research done certainly in the food industry uh, labs, and they have significant research programs. And uh, research certainly is driving uh, uh, the less use of chemicals, and that you can say some of it is also coming from the consumers these days not interested in uh, using the uh, food produced with less chemicals. Uh, so the farmers certainly have adopted that, and they are using the technology to reduce the uh, less chemicals. And uh, recently I had a fortune, a fortune to visit the Perry Farms, and they are using the technology which have reduced the, uh, the use of the chemicals by almost 80% of the kind of technology they are using. And all that was driven by research. And another area certainly are the consumers. The food industry relies very heavily on the uh, consumer feedback and takes that into consideration when they are deciding where they want to go. Uh, and there, I would say, consumers are becoming more health conscious. I would say uh, Majority of them now think about the connection between food and uh, food and health and diet. Uh, I wouldn't say everybody thinks about it. I hope everybody start thinking, but uh, certainly majority does. Uh, they at the at the same time, the consumers have also started what I would call a self-medication. So they take a lot of natural products uh, to improve their health. Uh, and sometimes uh, they don't uh, appreciate the consequences it would ha uh, could have, and that's where research certainly comes into play. 
population is aging and we all are uh, aging so we want to the one thing we want to make sure is that we live very long uh, we are uh, we are aging so we want to uh, and the processed food is a, another area where consumers have reduced the consumption of the processed food or they want to go consume more natural food or uh, as close to fresh as possible so that's trend consumers are driving and food industry then takes all that feedback Another source of the factor which drives the food industry trends are the healthcare professionals. Uh, what they recommend to their patients or, uh, or the people who go to visit the, visit the doctor or health practitioners or even the uh, nurse practitioners or natu uh, naturopaths or uh, they would advise the cons uh, people that you should be taking this kind of diet or this kind of diet and then that certainly then get fed to through consumers to the industry so, so they certainly affect that. Uh, new dis discoveries which come out, and sometimes the discoveries could be conflicting, and that's the challenge with the science. Uh, one study might say red wine is good for you, and a few months later there could be studies saying no, red wine is not that good for you. So it does confuse the uh, consumers. But when you look at the meta-analysis of the data, then the consumer trends do get set by the research uh, and which how the healthcare and professionals are promoting that. And the uh, new government, uh, the uh, non-governmental organizations support for the food industry also help the consumer make some decisions. Another area where the food industry get affected quite significantly is the government, where the government guidelines, uh, regulatory frameworks the government sets, uh, and then the rising healthcare cost. Uh, and certainly that drives also government to help promote the prevention side, for example, and that prevention usually comes from the food. Uh, and then the retailers and marketers are always lo looking for the growth opportunities and the unique product they can produce uh, better than the competitor, they then would go into that, uh, that product line. So these are the factors which drive the food industry trends. Next few slides I'm going to share with you uh, some of the trends. But first I want to share with you how consumers think. Like if you consider on the horizontal axis is the age and uh, on the vertical axis is the quality of life. So we typically have this kind of curve. So we have a certain quality of life uh, and then that lasts for a few years or uh, hopefully 50 years or something. And then it slowly starts deteriorating. So what we all want to have it's something like this that with time, we, what we want to have, we want the food industry to help us in extending that red line or extending that horizontal line a little longer and then dec the, or make that slope steeper. And if everything works out, something like this, we want to live to 100 years and when it's time to go, go. <laughs> okay? So that is what the consumers want. And that's what food industry is hoping to supply to you. So some of the trends we are looking in the food industry are, so the one thing for sure, the automation in the food industry, food processing is increasing, and that automation is coming in terms of the sorting, grading, uh, milling, or any other unit operations, so certainly automation, and, and you would say with the uh, almost uh, uh, 8 billion people, they, we should have enough labor for the food industry. There's always labor shortage in the food industry and agri-food industry, uh, always labor shortage. So, so that is driving the automation. Uh, food industry, I would say by and large, certainly in uh, North America for sure. Uh, but uh, I would say globally, uh, most of the food industry has started implementing has a program which is the hazardous uh, analysis at critical control points. So they are monitoring the uh, inputs and uh, make sure that, that the right quality is there. And impl by implementing that, they are trying to enhance the, is the quality of the product they are selling. Uh, I already mentioned the increased consumption of the plant-based proteins, uh, and that is certainly a major uh, uh, driving force. Uh, uh, use of the green technology in processing of the food uh, is very commonly increasing. Uh, one example would be is that rather than, for example, using the thermal processing or chemicals to extend the shelf life of the food, they are using high, pre high, uh, uh, high pressure 
to uh, control the microbes. And it then keeps the uh, product, and particularly the meat product, almost like fresh looking in that uh, uh, pack, uh, package uh, in, in, in the pouch, for example. And that would be considered as a green technology. Uh, other trend, which is the, uh, certainly the frozen food section is increasing. And if you go to the, uh, shop, uh, when you go for shopping for the foods, uh, canned foods, uh, also some canned vegetables are there, but I think with the newer technology, particularly with the uh, uh, metallic pouches uh, packaging technology, the canned food industry is decreasing, uh, but the frozen food industry is increasing, or these pouch, pouch production is increasing. Uh, other thing, uh, not that we have uh, uh, become lazy, but I think the technology uh, is pushing people. So there's a lot of people nowadays do the uh, uh, home delivery has increased. So, and all of the, uh, the large uh, 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 food companies who are marketing the food would do home delivery. So you don't have to even go out uh, to order, order your food. Uh, you order from the home and then they get delivered. Uh, there is a certainly internet of things, so the, there are connections in different devices and the connections that's increasing, and that is also helping drive the f uh, food industry. Uh, automation in home appliances. Uh, the automation has reached to the point that you can have a refrigerator which would uh, inventory every item in your fridge. It would keep track what you have consumed. And if you want to order uh, either on a daily basis, to con uh, integrate that with the Internet of Things and home delivery, it can get your replacement ne uh, the same day. You wanted to do it on a weekly basis, it would order you for a weekly basis. And uh, if you are willing to have a robot, uh, you, the, it can receive the groceries and then stack your fridge. And if you want, even deliver a beer for you. Uh, so it is the, that's the level of automation which is happening in the home appliances. Uh, and the, you don't have to go, go uh, even or do the ordering. So you, uh, the fridge would do the ordering, home delivery would come, robot would take it, and stack your fridge. And uh, certainly can bring it so far, uh, I don't think it can cook. Uh, robot can cook, but it certainly can bring you the beverages uh, to you. Uh, the, as I said, uh, the consumer certainly the healthy diet and exercise, uh, that's increasing and that's driving many products in the food industry. The one thing to keep in mind, the food waste uh, is a major concern and uh, you probably would be surprised, globally we lose one third of the food which is produced. And that, you can imagine how many people that food can feed. And for whatever reason, that's the one thing which I would say if my failure has been in my life is to, uh, that I have not been able to convince the governments that they should be investing in preserving that food and not invest a lot of money in producing more and then lose more. Uh, so very little attention has been paid for preservation of the food uh, and that's a serious concern. Uh, and that, uh, and f food of all types is lost, like it's not just the uh, grains uh, and the um, meats, uh, meats or fruits, but also the, the cooked food, a uh, lot of cooked food is also wasted. Uh, value added processing is increasing in the food industry where uh, products are produced uh, for the consumption by the ready to eat meats, for example, or ready to eat products. Uh, primary processing, and that's the uh, initial processing which is done at the farm level, is increasing. So farmers, when, when they finish harvesting, and they, they for example, might do a, a, a cleaning uh, or might do a, a grading, uh, and sometimes even pack in a small packages. Uh, so that is, would be considered primary processing, and that certainly is increasing. Or remove the field heat uh, if you are harvesting in the high temperatures in some parts of the world then remove the field heat using evaporative coolers, for example. Uh, there is a reduction in the chemical use, which I mentioned uh, in the earlier slide. Uh, eating out uh, has decreased, and this actually came, um, I would say, mainly from the COVID. The one thing COVID did was uh, made almost every one of us became cooks. Uh, we started cooking at home. Uh, those who have never even tried, they started trying different products. 
And I don't know if you, uh, I'm certainly one of them, I uh, couldn't find East uh, in the early three months of the COVID. You go any store, the all East was taken, uh, was purchased by people uh, because they, everybody started cooking, uh, cooking at home. So that has decreased the eating out, but then it, it certainly has increased cooking at home. Uh, and online purchasing and shipping has increased. Uh, the one thing on the, uh, on the uh, uh, cooking at home side is that people still spend a lot of time uh, cooking the dinner, but there's a lot of opportunity for food industry to prepare uh, ready to eat lunch and breakfast. Uh, uh, that's the area where food, food industry has not uh, invested enough uh, yet. Other one is the, uh, which is unfortunate, but that again, uh, that's another thing which I would say COVID uh, forced that. We started packaging food in the plastic, a uh, lot more packaging in the food where the uh, idea was that before COVID, we were decreasing the packaging of the food in the plastics. And particularly, again, if you go to the grocery store, you would have noticed that yourself is they used to have a bulk uh, containers where you could fill yourself uh, how much you not need. Now they already package in the plastic and the small packets. So if you need more, you have to buy three plastic bags uh, rather than you filling yourself one. So it, it has increased the uh, plastic uh, in the food industry. Uh, impact of climate change certainly is significant having impact on the food industry, uh, particularly on the production side. And because there are uh, 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 bio agents or I would say insects and microflora which may not be present in certain parts of the uh, world. And now with increased temperature, global warming, the diversity of the uh, pests which can infest food is increasing. Uh, so that is having impact uh, on the food industry. And uh, that also, but at the same time, it is having impact on uh, even the processed food or the uh, storage. So when you have a, a food which is uh, in the distribution chain, if it is exposed to the higher temperatures, it can spoil. Uh, so it is having impact on both the production and the processing side. Uh, as the food prices are increase, uh, increased and they, they are increasing uh, certainly and uh, we all know the, the uh, cost of living and the, and the CPI numbers at what level it has reached and a lot of those prices then pass down to the consumers. So the food industry is basically uh, a lot of these costs uh, are coming their way as inputs they pass it down to the consumer and then you feel that food prices are going up. Uh, four R principle is commonly used now in food industry and four R principle basically is that apply the right chemical at the right rate at the right time uh, and, and in the uh, right uh, to the, uh, the problem you're trying to solve. So if you're trying to kill an insect uh, per certain type then use that right chemical rather than applying a broad-based uh, chemical to do the treatment. And that's certainly industry using. Uh, consumers are becoming very aware of the food quality and they are demanding industry to uh, produce the high quality food. Uh, automation in the quality uh, is increasing in the quality monitoring and uh, quality monitoring is done at multiple points. So when I say food quality, what does that mean? So if you look at the food quality, uh, basically, producer is the producing the food, and some food is directly marketed to the consumer. And there is other food which are then given to the processor, and then they would uh, go to the retailer and then and, and the consumer. So anytime when somebody, so when consumer is buying food uh, products, they are looking at the physical appearance. Uh, they may not be able to look at what's in, in internal defects are, but certainly they are looking at the appearance. Sometimes the uh, uh, misshapen food, uh, you might say uh, you would not buy it, but it's perfectly okay food. There's nothing wrong, wrong, uh, wrong in terms of its nutritional values and all that. And that's where I think the food industry can come in. Uh, so for example, you can take all the misshapen food, you can uh, wash it, slice it, and package it in a package, and deliver it at a lunch, uh, uh, lunch uh, cut fruit or cut uh, vegetables for a lunch uh, time, for example. So you can make an industry out of it, but a lot of the misshapen food right now does get uh, thrown away or wasted. 
so the consumers are looking some quality characteristics. Uh, similarly, processor, when they receive the uh, product, they do the quality assessment, and they are also doing the similar assessment on the, uh, uh, all, the, all the components they are putting in the food, so ingredients. That's why, uh, and then that processed food goes to the uh, retailers, and retailers then sell it to the consumer. At that stage, consumer, when it is a packaged food, they are really looking at the shape of the package. So if the package is uh, uh, like even a can, uh, like when people go and buy canned food, and if the can is a uh, little uh, dropped on the floor or something, again, the food uh, is pretty good in there, but people would not buy a can which has been damaged uh, during the handling process. So food industry have to be very careful uh, even when delivering those, those pa packaged food products. Uh, but the quality monitoring in the food industry is done at, uh, at many points. So this slide gives you an idea. So if you are, are planning to prepare a food product and you need 20 ingredients, then all of those individually, all those ingredients are individually monitored for the quality and quality is assessed. So that's what I say, ingredient 1 to N uh, on the left hand side. Then you do an, a unit operation or you do handle that product and do some processing. Uh, then you do the mo quality monitoring after that unit operation. And if you have multi-unit operations, you do that quality monitoring every point. Uh, and in the end, uh, if you are introducing another ingredient, M, in the process somewhere, you need to do the quality assessment of that ingredient, M, and then unit operation, and then finally the finished product. So you can imagine if all of this has to be done manually, how expensive it could be. Uh, so that's where the automation uh, comes into play, and that's where some of the research our group has done can play a role. So the quality parameters which are uh, assessed in the food industry are the extrin uh, extrinsic features, uh, which basically means external features, and they are usually based on you know, size, shape, color, and texture of the food, uh, food material. Uh, so size and shape are obvious, color is also obvious, but textural features are looking at the roughness or a smoothness of the surface of the food material. And intrinsic features, those are the features which are uh, both at the initially, like what value of those, uh, those are uh, intrinsic features, but also how it is changing, changing with time. So the constituents, so like could be protein content, uh, could be internal damage uh, to the food product, uh, or could be uh, fat content or carbohydrate content, so that's the nutritional components which, we, which meets our need. And in the food industry, the, all of these features are grouped into, so there are physical contaminants uh, when you're dealing in the food industry, so there could be dirt, depending on the, what food material is being processed, could be metal parts, glass, pins, uh, plastic, bones, uh, and, or any other undesired materials which are physically separable, but uh, uh, th those are physical contaminants. There could be chemical contaminants, those are pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, larvicides, uh, cleaning supplies, uh, because not, uh, like the, even the cleaning supplies used for cleaning the floors and the machinery sometimes can get mixed with the food chain uh, 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 processing line. So all of that has to be uh, monitored and any other chemical product. Similarly, there are biological contaminants. So those, those could be insects, uh, 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 mold, fungi, pathogens, and uh, uh, bioterrorism agents. Uh, so typically, the, uh, as I was saying, the quality monitoring is done using human beings. Uh, so that's what I call a typical food quality monitoring. And when you do the quality monitoring using human beings, uh, you can, these are the, some of the issues which arise. It's subjective. Even with training, a lot of training, you require a lot of training. And even with training, the, you, you still are uh, making a subjective decision. It's inconsistent, tedious, very slow. Uh, possibility of cross-contamination, uh, some like we expect people to uh, take care of uh, themselves, be hygiene uh, when they are working in the food industry, but sometimes they touch wrong thing with the wrong hand and uh, you can have a contamination issue. Uh, so, uh, and not suitable for continuous online monitoring, the human, human process. It's expensive, and you would say why it is expensive is that the number of people involved, uh, so the labor cost becomes very high, so the operational cost is very high, whereas in an automated system, 
the capital cost is high, but then operational cost goes down. So it's expensive when you compare the whole system. And the need to improve the monitoring is speed in many industries. And just using humans, uh, it is very difficult to create multiple lines because the number of people required and the space required to create multiple lines becomes uh, very, uh, very cost prohibitive. So there is an alternative. And that's the digital image processing. Uh, and so that basically, initially that technology was developed uh, in, for the space applications in the 60s, then in medical applications in the, in the 70s, uh, and then remote sensing and astronomy uh, in the, also in the same time. And today, almost every field uh, uses the technology. It's very inexpensive. It, uh, uh, takes the images of the objects, and then from those images, it uh, extracts the information and help make the decisions. So digital image processing, fast uh, cameras, computers, uh, and availability to ready to software now. Uh, so you, uh, in the initial stages, you have to write lo a long software to use that technology. Nowadays, you can buy off-the-self software. So all that has increased the use of uh, image processing or digital image processing for monitoring the quality of the food. And some of the technologies, uh, so when I say imaging, what basically that means is the assessing the physical and chemi uh, or chemical uh, objects using spectral devices. And spectral devices, camera is the just one spectral device because it, it looks at the object in the visible range, what human being sees. Uh, so that's what camera is looking. But you can have other spectral devices which can look beyond the human vision, so in the ultraviolet range or in the infrared range or even microwave or any of the ranges, so the whole spectrum. Uh, and the bioimaging is basically taking those principles and apply that to the biological materials. And food is a biological material in all its forms. So that's why uh, uh, I use the term bioimaging, which is assessing the biological objects rather than physical or chemical objects using the same technology. Uh, so the bioimaging uh, is an artificial, uh, artificial visualization and potentially using a large spectrum rather than just the human uh, vision based on the visible spectrum. Uh, and it uh, uh, the, the purpose is to observe, capture, process, and analyze the object of interest. Uh, uh, it characterizes the complex size, shape, color, and textural, and intrinsic properties of the food, so internal as well as external properties. And that's what I think, as I said earlier, human being, when you go to purchase food, you are looking at the external features of the product. Uh, and it can, the imaging system can do that. And when you take a picture, the image is nothing but is a really a XY representation of the object. So you, at every coordinate of the image, there is a gray scale or the, uh, the color value or the gray scale value, which basically gives you the information, which then you analyze to do the classification. So this is the spectrum that I was talking about. So we use the, if you see the uh, VIS in the middle is the visible spectrum and how narrow that is compared to the whole spectrum. And you could use the spectral system in every of those ranges to do the detection of the different uh, internal and external features. And there are systems available, or cameras available now. So the basic components of an imaging system is the camera itself. And there are many different types of cameras, as I mentioned in this slide, the charge coupled device. Most of your uh, iPhone cameras are basically uh, those cameras. Uh, complementary metal oxide silicon is another one, CMOS cameras. You can buy a thermal camera that looks at the near infrared or infrared range. You can buy hyperspectral camera, uh, X ray detectors. Uh, hyperspectral basically is that uh, the, the same camera takes the images at multiple wavelengths. So uh, you get a curve at every point uh, of, the, uh, of the object. Other s systems you need or other components are the illumination system. If you don't have proper lighting, I'm sure uh, try to do something in the dark. It's not that easy. Or if light is poor, uh, you really can't uh, figure out what you are seeing. Or so that's what I think we have to provide the right illumination system to the camera. And then the image processing software, when you collect all this data, then how you extract the information from that. And then use that information. Once you have collected the features, use that for classification purpose. So this is how the 
simple classification system works is so you need some object to train the system. So you have a, a training object images, extract the features from those, and then create a feature database. And then when you bring an unknown object, you still extract the features and then compare those extracted features to the database that how does it look like. So if you have a kernel of wheat, would have a different features than the kernel of barley, for example. And when you compare those features, it would be able to say, this is a wheat kernel or this is a barley kernel, as an example. And that's how the object is recognized, and you take that information in, in your decision making. Uh, so some of the systems, so this is an example of a color imaging system, which is uh, basically uh, what your uh, uh, smartphones do th uh, these days. Uh, you would have illumination system there is provided by that uh, fluorescent tube around the sample on the black platform there. And in the middle of that black platform are the kernels or in uh, kernels of wheat uh, uh, or any any object could be there uh, and and then the steel dome in, uh, uh, inverted dome is really to make sure that the object is very well lit so it's diffusing diffusing uh, the light so any light which is coming from the fluorescence hits the top and then go down back on the on the object so our object is well lit so that's what the illuminous system is. Uh, there is a that this uh, the, the, the the that camera you saw was a what we are referred to as an area scan camera, and that same thing what your smartphone does it takes the picture of an area. Uh, you can also have cameras which are which take the picture of a line. So this is an, a line scan system, and as the object is moving, so either your object can move, or your camera can move. Either way, you can have either kind of system, but it taking a picture a line at a time, and if you put all the lines together you have the area, it still has the area in the end. Uh, and the, the reason why uh, line, is, line scan camera becomes very significant in the food industry is because most of the processing is done uh, bulk and, and moving belts. Uh, so you need the line scan camera to be able to scan the moving objects rather than area scan because where you would have to stop, take image, and then stop, and that uh, doesn't work. It's work. Area scan is good for research labs uh, to do a lot of experiments, but once you start looking at the automation, then you have to go to the line scan system. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is an example of the soft X-ray system looking at the insects inside the grain kernels. And as you can see from the images, uh, the larvae, developing larvae are uh, visible inside even to the naked eye. Uh, so if you use an X-ray, uh, you can then basically do, once you do the analysis, you can detect uh, internal feeding insects in the, in the objects. And this is just an example uh, where uh, like five different types of insects were detected with that kind of accuracy using that system. Uh, you would say why we have to spend so much money to detect uh, insects inside the grain. Insects, like they multiply so quickly they can become a major problem very quickly. So if you do not detect hidden infestation, it may be on a farmer's truck, you take a sample and you don't detect the hidden infestation, that truck then goes into the bin. A few days later, it goes in a larger bin and then insect hatch out of the grain and they start infesting and multiplying. So in about a month, you have infested the whole grain handling system, okay? And you need to now do the whatever treatment you want to do to uh, get rid of those insects. So if you can detect early on, that's why you would want to use or spend that kind of resources in doing the monitoring. And this is an example of the thermal imaging that's looking at the infrared, so just at the edges of the human vision system. And simple uh, way of understanding this is that it basically looks at the uh, temperature profile on the object. And the, typically what you can do is if you heat the object for 30 seconds or even 10 seconds, so take an image before heating and then take another image after heating, and you would be able to see the differences. Like, so if let's say there's an insect inside, again using the example from the X-ray one, if there is a kernel insect inside, it would heat differently than if it was a sound kernel. And just seeing the difference between the two images, you would know this is infested kernel and this is not. Uh, hyperspectral, on the other hand, is the, as I said, it takes the image, uh, uh, like every point it gets the spectrum, and from that spectrum then you can classify. So in, this is an example where we could uh, do a sprout damage detection, um, mids damage, fungal damage, uh, and even predict the protein content, oil content, uh, 
with a very high uh, R, R value or R is, is the correlation coefficient value. Mm, and another way of looking at it, so this is the way you look at it. So at every point of that image you are seeing on the left-hand side uh, is a spectrum, and that spectral difference is what tells you what this object is or what defect it, is, uh, defect it has or what internal characteristic it has. Another way of looking at it, this example of the hyperspectral imaging system giving you so tender meat, medium, and tough meat, it has a different spectral characteristics. And uh, if your meat is going under the hyperspectral camera, it can grade that into three categories. Or if you are a particular cu customer group uh, is only want uh, uh, tender, it can then reject the medium and the, uh, the hard meat automatically and then direct to a different belt and use for different purpose. Uh, so uh, this is just an example from the meat industry. Uh, another thing in the food industry, uh, the logistic, uh, the food industry always works is first in, first out, because usually the biological materials is spoil, uh, the first in is the wood is spoiled first. It works very well if there is a consistent uh, input material coming in. But quality monitoring, if you do the monitoring at multiple points and you know what the quality of the material is, you can use that information to change that first in, first out. So you can say, and again, if I use the example of wheat, uh, there's a parcel of wheat which is, uh, uh, came only a month ago, but uh, would spoil, uh, spoil in, let's say, three weeks. So you might want to process that wheat parcel first and let the other one sit, which uh, still have a self life. And that principle can be applied to any product, raw, any raw material, any process material, where you can use the information you collect using the image processing system to direct your processing. Uh, so, so industry has started adopting that and changed the logistics in the food industry. With that, uh, I finish the talk, but I thank uh, researchers in the field because uh, one thing, uh, certainly I have benefited a lot from researchers all over the world who work in the different areas uh, which I, I work in. And so I build on their research, uh, so I thank them. I thank a lot of my collaborators. Uh, as you can see, being an agriculture engineer, uh, uh, you get a lot of exposed to a lot of things, but you have to work with many people. So for my grain storage research, I work with entomologists. Uh, for my uh, spectral work uh, with electrical engineers, with physicists, with chemists, uh, with agriculture economists, when we are looking at uh, uh, convincing arguments. So I collaborated with many people, and I thank them for their willingness to work with me and uh, help solve some of these problems. Uh, most of the work uh, is not only me. I think every university professor, if not every, I would say majority of the university professors, if they do work, their work is done by the graduate students, uh, both masters and doctoral postdoctoral fellows, research associate, and uh, I certainly have benefited from uh, their, their work uh, and their, uh, their project, uh, uh, project works. Uh, you can't do research without funding, uh, and so a lot of organizations uh, have provided funding for this research. Uh, NSERC, which is all of the natural sciences and uh, engineers receive funding. Similarly, there is a CERC, which funds the social sciences, humanity researchers and CIHR, which funds the health researchers. So there are three agencies in nationally which fund Canada Foundation for Innovation, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, uh, Agriculture Research Development Initiative, that's the Manitoba uh, Initiative. Uh, in my case, I received significant funding from the province of Manitoba and from the industry, uh, so Canadian Wheat Board, uh, OP System, a Calgary company, works very closely with, uh, with, uh, worked with, very closely with us in Manitoba. IDERS is a company which uh, worked in the sensors area and then helped develop many sensors. And Prince Rupert Grain is where we did a lot of testing of our, our automation system. So we did develop a robot which would open the rail car gate and close the rail car gate and take the samples and uh, predict what's in, the, in this uh, uh, rail car. Uh, and the reason that automation w was needed was if you unload a wrong car, a uh, wrong rail car uh, and then dump in the pit, it has to be manually cleaned. Because Canadian system is not designed to receive grain, it is only uh, designed to sip. So, uh, th and those become very expensive mistakes. So if you can automate that and uh, with the consistency which computer systems can provide, 
then you avoid that, that issue. So we did the testing at the Prince Rupert Grain. And with that, I thank you uh, very much, and uh, I certainly can answer questions. Uh. In the next episode, U. Lethbridge Therapeutic Recreation Professor Dr. Sienna Casper examines knowledge translation and mobilization in healthcare.